Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, so I'm very excited to have you all here um, to this Sparkle workshop. And I want to say a few words about uh, how this works and um, why we're doing this and uh, introduce our guests and give you a sense of the agenda and what's going to happen in the next two hours. So um, can people see my screen? Nope. Shoot. All right. So. Um, why this workshop? So Stas and I talked a while ago, and uh, we realized really there is like a, a big gap at the moment, uh, uh, both social and technical, between Wikidata and the rest of our projects. Um, and I feel like uh, uh, this is something that I wanted to address personally and uh, give people an opportunity to understand more about uh, uh, what's the deal, not just with Wikidata per se, but also with the APIs that uh, make it possible to retrieve data from, uh, from Wikidata. Um, and so I, I see this, uh, this opportunity primarily as a, a space for analysts, scientists, uh, product managers, engineers to learn about uh, these APIs, uh, learn a little bit about the, uh, uh, the syntax um, that is used by, by uh, the query service, uh, see what's possible with it, um, and, uh, and also hopefully clear some myths around uh, Wikidata. And the one thing I wanted to start, start from is the fact that uh, I often hear that uh, Wikidata, oh, is this like a insular project uh, that is out there, built by people who speak German. And, uh, <laughs> and sure, it's a cool thing, it's growing, but we don't quite know what it does. It's, multi, it's mostly a place for glam people or open data people to dump data into it, uh, or maybe to connect articles via inter-language inter links, but that's pretty much what it is. And I think that's a big misunderstanding about Wikidata is and what it represents. And I wanted to take like 30 seconds to show you one query that to me represents the future of Wikipedia and Wikimedia projects. Um, so that's a curious case of uh, Francesco Primo Gattilusio. So uh, this guy is uh, someone who was born in Genova in the 14th century. Um, and it's a, um, a notable Italian individual, uh, according to the National Biographical Dictionary, uh, that the most popular source of uh, notable individuals in Italy. And if you check uh, his Wikidata entry, um, you will see that, uh, well, there's a quite a lot of information about, about this guy. And it turns out that uh, he has an entry in nine language editions on Wikipedia, except for Italian. Um, and I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, it's, it's such a low hanging fruit that there should be uh, an Italian Wikipedia article about this guy who's notable in this uh, uh, biographical dictionary and notable in nine other editions. How come that, is, that exists? And there's a query that allows you to see how many Francesco Gattelluzio uh, we have. And it turns out uh, that we have uh, over 1,000. And this is just for whatever currently um, exists in Wikidata based on the matching with this, uh, with this dictionary. So to me, this is an example of how, like right now, we think of Wikidata as something that's created after a Wikipedia article to add some additional data. Three, four years from now, maybe two years from now, I expect the contributions on Wikipedia will start from Wikidata as a backbone of the entities that need to be expanded and created, and we'll see freeform text flow from uh, structured data as opposed to the other way around. Um, but with that, I just want to show this example uh, to, to uh, sort of give you a sense of why I think this is going to be a, a big thing in the, in the next couple of years. Um, but I, wanna, I don't want to take too much time, and I want to go over um, our agenda. Um, and first off, uh, introduce our guests. So I'm very glad to have today uh, people who have been using Sparkle and Wikidata for a while, for fun and for business. And uh, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ruben from uh, Ghent University, uh, who I had the pleasure to meet at a conference uh, a few weeks ago. Um, you gave a very compelling speech on uh, uh, Sparkle endpoints uh, and federated queries. So I'm very happy to have him here today. Uh, we also have uh, Benjamin Good. Uh, like, uh, Ruben, are you there? Can you say hi? 
Absolutely. Thanks for having me here. Welcome, everybody. And I'm uh, really excited to talk about uh, Sparkle today. Fantastic. And it's 9 p.m. Uh, where Ruben is, so extra bonus points for being with us uh, <laughs> such, such a late time. Um, we also have a, a Ben and team from the Scripps uh, Research Institute and from uh, Gene Wiki. Uh, Gene Wiki, uh, for those of you who don't know about the project, is an amazing project uh, that used to be built on top of Wikipedia. Now, uh, this group is working with Wikidata directly to basically uh, annotate, uh, to store facts uh, that are extracted from literature uh, in, the, in the area of like bioinformatics uh, and uh, genomic research uh, uh, more specifically, make sure this data is uh, available and represented on Wikidata and can be used by other scientific communities as well as uh, our own contributors and readers. I think this is like a fantastic project. It's one of my favorite examples of uh, expert contribution to Wikidata. And uh, Benjamin and team are going to give us a, um, an overview of how they're using Wikidata and Sparkle in their own projects. Um, are you guys there? Can you see us? Yep. All right. Fantastic. And finally, we have uh, Lucas, who's going to be uh, helping as a facilitator um, today. Uh, Lucas runs uh, Wikidata Facts, which is a tremendously useful Twitter handle uh, that showcases like many types of Sparkle queries uh, and helps people like uh, understand Sparkle and understand Wikidata one query at a time. So again, very happy to have you too, Lucas, um, uh, to help with the rest of the of the workshop. And if you're there, say hi. Very glad to be here. Hi. Hi. Welcome. And so with that, like a few practical uh, notes about the structure of the, of the workshop. So we're going to start with two talks uh, by Stas and Ruben. It's going to be roughly 25 minutes plus five minutes for Q&A. Um, after that, we're going to have a, a short break of 10 minutes. We're going to continue with a presentation by Tim and Ben. And we'll have the remaining 45 minutes for basically hacking, playing with examples on the Wikidata query service, um, and uh, answering any questions that people may have uh, um, around uh, Sparkle. Um, we'll be recording the, uh, the presentations, so uh, just be aware that if you don't want to be recorded, um, uh, you should not be joining the um, BlueJeans um, uh, call, and, uh, and you should mute yourself. And we will not be recording the, uh, the second part, so we'll have like a uh, fail-safe uh, space for learning and hacking and asking questions. Uh, there's also an IRC channel that uh, Nick will be um, hosting. Uh, so if you have any, any questions uh, and you have a, uh, something during, the, uh, during the, the presentation you want to discuss, please post your comments on IRC. Uh, we'll be relaying them to the speakers. Um, also, final note, uh, the microphones here are not working because we're recording. And so if you have something, I'll be relaying your questions to the speakers. Um, and with that, I'm not going to take more time, and uh, Stas, I think the stage is yours, and you can get started. Hello. So, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, for the beginning of the presentation, um, first uh, two short points. Uh, uh, first thing, I'm uh, sorry I plan to be um, there in person to help uh, with the later Q&A and hacking session. Uh, uh, due to injury, I'm not able to, so please uh, ask any questions you have on RC or later in email or RC channels. And second, uh, there is a lot of material to cover and uh, not a lot of time, so I'll be glossing over and rushing through uh, uh, several things. Uh, so please ask uh, later if you have anything unclear or uh, if you want to know more. And there will be a list of literature at the end. So um, I refer to that uh, too. So with that, uh, first thing I wanted to start is uh, Wikidata. So a short, a very short refresher on what Wikidata is. Wikidata is a free structured knowledge base uh, where the data is represented on uh, many languages. No language has a preferential status, unlike, for example, English Wikipedia, where uh, English is uh, the language. So we'll see how important it is later. And uh, it's it's uh, under a free license, so it's designed to be uh, the data to be reused and mixed and matched and so on. And it's around uh, 20 million entities now, so it's a pretty big uh, database. 
And uh, let's see an example how the data looks like. So this is the data about the city of London. So here we see, first of all, a multilingual aspect. We have a lot of names. And uh, a very interesting thing is that on the top uh, left corner, you see the Q84. So that's the true name of the item in the uh, wiki data. And that's the name where it is known to all the data. It's not London, it's Q84. And London is just an English name. And it's not any more special or preferred than a Russian name or Spanish name or Hebrew name. It's uh, just uh, one of the strings that belong to this item. And uh, when we do Sparkle queries, we actually will be dealing a lot with these Q things instead of labels. And we will see how to deal with them well without uh, going crazy. Uh, so the next thing we see is the statements. So all the data except for labels are organized in statements. And the statement has internal structure, uh, which um, consists of a property. That's uh, what we are talking about. Like, for example, for London, it might be population or mayor or when it's founded, uh, a type of the things that we're talking about. It has a value, uh, which uh, uh, describes what is actually um, uh, the data that we have. And it also has two things additional. It can have a qualifier, which adds additional information for population. It might be when when it happened or how we know it. Or for mayor, it one might be uh, the times that uh, uh, he or she served as a mayor and so on. So it's a kind of uh, things that uh, describe uh, more uh, details uh, pertinent to this piece of information. And there is also a reference that says basically where we know this thing from. So it might be from Wikipedia, from some journal, from some URL, uh, a lot of from some other encyclopedia, a lot of uh, things. Uh, so, so all together, it's called a statement. So uh, this is how the data is uh, on the Wikidata. And uh, the next thing is how to make this data a knowledge. What I mean by that is uh, how we can use this data beyond uh, stating uh, the uh, mere facts, how we can uh, make inferences and uh, learn facts that are not stated directly for in Wikidata. And the famous question that uh, we are uh, was asked that started the whole uh, the service thing is what are the biggest cities having female mayors? So uh, to get the, this answer from just the, the data that uh, is present on Wikidata, a uh, manual is kind of hard. You have to go to all the big, big cities and check the mayors and check if uh, they are females and make a list and sort it uh, for, uh, and so on. So um, that's that's kind of a lot of work. So we want, want uh, engine to give us answers to these questions, and we will see how we do it. Uh, but uh, we will start from. Uh, representing the data in the uh, format that is uh, available for such queries. And this format is RDF. So RDF is a short for resource data framework, and it is a very simple way of representing knowledge. Uh, basically, it, it con contains uh, three things. So each RDF uh, data item uh, is called a triple, and it contains of three things, subject, predicate, and object. So subject is what we are talking about, for example, London. Uh, predicate is uh, what uh, we are expressing, like population. And object is what is the actual uh, content of this knowledge, what we are saying about it. So London population is 8 million and change. Uh, London is subject, uh, population is predicate, and object is uh, 8 million. And so uh, we, we have uh, other statements that we can make. Uh, basically, um, a lot of knowledge can be represented this way. And another thing you may notice is that uh, this structure is very similar to how graphs look like. So we can represent uh, uh, any knowledge like this as a graph. And uh, alternatively, any directed graph can be represented as RDF. So uh, how this is uh, relevant, relevant to Wikidata? Uh, Okay, first, how we actually write this down. So, uh, as I say, RDF is a very abstract concept. It's just saying three things. 
but uh, in computer we have to write it down so there are a lot of ways to write it down uh, you can write it basically uh, you can write it in any form you can write it as xml you can write it as json you can write it as s expressions you can write it as basically anything you like but the way we are actually will be using in this um, presentation is uh, two formats that are important. First format is N triples. It's a very simple format. You just write uh, these three things that you're talking about, one after another, space separated and put a dot in the end. So here you have a subject N triples, predicate is and, uh, a and the object line based. Uh, so this format is very simple. Uh, line based uh, can be processed by a lot of tools. And, uh, but uh, the downside of this pro uh, format it's it's very verbose and if you see actual data in this format it's kind of hard to read uh, because uh, each triple contains all the information including long urls and so on so there is a shortcut format that's called turtle which allows to, to write the same data in a bit more human uh, friendly uh, way and it allows you to use shorter uh, shorter uh, form of writing the URLs in subjects, in uh, objects, uh, sorry, and uh, also allows you to uh, not repeat uh, uh, subjects and uh, predicates. Uh, we'll see how, how that works a bit later, but uh, the important thing is to, to, to know that Turtle is the format that we will be using discussing Sparkle, and uh, this is how the triples are expressed in uh, uh, Sparkle, and that this is one of the ways that LDF can be represented. So now let's see how we actually represent Wikidata. So Wikidata, as we have seen uh, a bit uh, before, is kind of complex. You have uh, statements, you have qualifiers, you have uh, references, and so on. So uh, this is the graph that uh, actually shows how we represent it. You don't need to remember it. You just kind of need to glance at it and see uh, uh, level of complexity. So uh, don't expect yourself to remember all of it. You probably will need to refer to the documentation from time to time to uh, get the, uh, some aspects of it. Uh, but it's not like super complicated. It's uh, about a dozen uh, things that uh, you need to remember. So let's see, that is actual representation of an item. In, so first of all, we see that uh, a turtle format. So we have, uh, again, we have a uh, subject, predicate, and object. And uh, we have a, a semicolon, which says basically we are still talking about the same uh, a subject. So that's one of the things that uh, turtle format allows us which is uh, pretty convenient and we can have uh, a number of things that we can write down in this format uh, first one of the things the most common things is node or uri it's basically uh, almost the same as url and it usually in total it usually contains about uh, uh, contains of a prefix and a suffix uh, separated by column prefix is a standard so we have a bunch of standard prefixes for example wd uh, from Wikidata is a uh, standard prefix for all the items, and uh, Wikibase is a um, standard prefix for all the things that relate to uh, things that uh, uh, are in Wikidata, like items. Uh, also, we have literals, which can be strings or numbers, or it can be uh, typed, for example, dates. Uh, strings can have also language, and we have a, a can have typed strings like date time. Uh, we can also have blank notes, but we won't go there because it's kind of um, not, uh, we don't have time to, to go there. So this is basically how a typical uh, a turtle uh, data set looks like. And it, this is also how Sparkle query data would look like when we get to it later. So just um, look at it, that, that's, that's how it uh, works. So now we get to Sparkle. So Sparkle is the language uh, to query RDF data. So the name is part of, uh, is um, a, a kind of a recursive acronym, uh, which means Sparkle Protocol and RDF Query Language. And uh, what it, it is, uh, the, its quality, it's, it's the declarative language. Uh, it's SQL-like, so if you know SQL, you kind of have a rough idea of how uh, Sparkle would look like. Maybe not how it works, but at least it would look kind of familiar to you. Uh, 
Uh, if you don't know declarative, basically means that unlike languages like C or PHP, you don't tell the uh, language processor what you want it to do. You only tell it what you want to get. You describe the data you want to get, and uh, it uh, uh, gets uh, it, the data uh, to you from the description. Uh, so this description um, in Sparkle basically composed of um, triple patterns. Uh, we'll see a bit later and uh, filters and kind of uh, modifiers and tra transformation on uh, these triple patterns. And triple patterns are uh, expressed in turtle syntax, the syntax we just seen, and it uh, produces uh, the values uh, out of it. Uh, which are the results of our queries. So let's uh, let's look at some queries. Uh, so this uh, here's the simple query that finds all the cats on uh, Wikidata. So uh, what we see in this query, uh, the first thing uh, that uh, we have the first line after where is the triple pattern. So in this triple pattern, we have three things. We have the green things, which are fixed details. So again, WD is the item. And uh, WT is the predicate. We'll get uh, later to how we know what they mean. J for now, just believe me that uh, the, the 146 is a cat and 31 is instance of. And uh, we get uh, this item thing. So item things is a variable and it's custom to write in Sparkle variables with question mark uh, 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 before them. So basically what this uh, pattern means is that we want all triples that have a two, a two uh, elements at the end be uh, fixed ones, and the first one can be whatever um, is there. So this is kind of a match that would return series of elements matching this pattern. Uh, so another thing uh, that we have in this query is uh, basically the select and the projection variables. So this uh, looks a lot like SQL. That's not a coincidence. It basically works a lot like SQL. So select query basically is for retrieving things. There are other queries in uh, Sparkle, but we won't be discussing them today. And uh, uh, then there are go variables. And then you have where. Uh, select is almost where for the, uh, 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 and in where for today, at least. We won't be considering any other possibilities. And another thing we have is a service. Uh, we will talk a bit uh, later about what services are. For now, it's kind of just magic box that produces things that we cannot do by Sparkle uh, uh, triple matching. And this uh, specific kind of magic box, which co is called the label service, is producing labels. So instead of uh, uh, these Q things, we would be seeing actual uh, names of, of, uh, of uh, the labels, and uh, EN means that these labels will be in English. So we will talk about uh, how services work a bit later, but right now basically we can see that this query produces a list of items and their names of the cats in uh, uh, Wikipedia, in Wikidata, sorry. So uh, let's go to the more complex query. So here we, instead of cats, we get, have a list of billionaires on uh, Wikidata. So uh, first the thing we see here in uh, after where is again the triple pattern. So you can see now that the, there is a two variables in triple pattern. Generally, um, it can be all three, but then you basically say, um, give me all data, which is rarely use useful. So usually it's, it's uh, one or two things in a triple pattern that is fixed. And uh, the Third, third one uh, or two or one is a uh, variable. That's usually how it happens. So uh, what we see um, here, uh, the new things is filter. Filter is a, a thing that allows you to basically apply a filter on the, on the triples that we match and only choose ones that uh, satisfy certain condition. So for he, here we want the condition that uh, the net worth of this individual that we selected there would be one more than one billion dollars. And uh, another thing is bind that basically allows you to create new variables from expressions as for use them later. So now we have a, a variable that is, expresses how many billions that that person has. Uh, we have set the label again. And another new thing, we can order things. So we can uh, get uh, the most uh, billionaire person uh, first. 
So again, it looks a lot like SQL, if you're familiar with. It's not a coincidence. Uh, it's uh, designed this way to remind you of, of that. And uh, then select, again, we see the variables that uh, we have uh, produced. So now we are mostly ready to see the query that uh, we started our discussion with. This is the actual query that uh, selects uh, top 10 uh, cities with female males. So uh, again, we see a number of triple patterns. So uh, this is an important thing. Before we saw only one triple patterns, but they can actually be combined. And uh, the way it works is that uh, the result has to satisfy all of them. Uh, and the variable, if it mentioned in 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 several part, of course, the value would be the same in in all uh, all parts. So so it's kind of a, a bit like join in in uh, SQL, uh, but it's just a number of patterns. So we have here in the first line we have something that is called a path expression. I won't be going too much into that because it's a bit complex and we don't have time. But basically, it allows you to, instead of just match. Uh, one triple, it allows you to specify a path on graph. We saw uh, before that the triples are kind of like graphs. So this is kind of a path on graph that you want to match. And beginning of the end of this path is uh, what you say. And uh, we have uh, uh, another filter that is filter not exist. So this is a negative filter. That means that basically you want to say that something would not be matched. Uh, so why we need this uh, this filter? So if we will read the comments, we basically find the cities and we find heads of government, and uh, then we uh, find that uh, this head of government is female, and then we want to say that uh, this head of government should be actual head of government, not past one, because we want only current mayor. We could we could have omitted that and have a query that uh, selects all the mayors past and present, but for this query we want only present. So we have a negative filter on end of the uh, of the uh, service, and this way we ensure that only current uh, uh, only current mayors are included. And uh, then we um, select the population, we order population, and then we have another familiar from SQL is uh, limit. So we can limit how many results uh, are we getting, and this is very useful clause when we. Uh, actually and have a potential of have, uh, having a lot uh, of uh, results because if you don't put a limit on it, it might time out. So if you have a complex query that potentially turns a lot of results, do use limit, otherwise you get timeout. So now let's get to this uh, magic box of service uh, a bit and to talk about it. So basically service is a piece of um, a code uh, that uh, uh, in this implementation is a Java code that allows you to do uh, various uh, magical things that are not available directly in Sparkle. And currently, in this implementation, we have uh, uh, a number of services. The most important is the label service, which ba can basically produce the labels and descriptions of items. And uh, the way it works is if you put the service clause in the query and you select an item, and you then uh, ask for a variable with the label or description or alias attached to it, it would produce this label or description or uh, alias if it's there. And you can gi give it a number of languages. So you can see, uh, I want Spanish label. If it doesn't have Spanish, then give me French. If it doesn't, then give me English. And if uh, uh, everything fails, then you will get this boring Q number instead. But you will get something at least that you can display. Uh, next service is a very interesting one. It's a search around. So basically what you will get is um, you will get uh, all the things around the certain location and you can tell it the center, which uh, in this case is coordinates of Berlin. You can give it a radius in kilometers and you can also get uh, the distance from it. And uh, then you can, um, for example, order by it or you can just, or you can uh, match uh, for example, this query finds airports within 100 kilometers of Berlin, so you can all get, get everything in within 100 kilometers and you will check that this is an airport and then you sort by distance. So this is another useful service for uh, um, map searches. 
And there is also uh, search uh, that also geographical, but searches in a box. So this query uh, gets everything that is in a box between San Jose and San Francisco, for example. Okay, so now we get to um, how we actually work with the queries. So, uh, so far I showed you um, the uh, kind of queries that uh, was pre-produced, but how you actually do this by yourself. So you use the the query uh, the query GUI, which is at uh, query.wikidata.org. Uh, so uh, uh, basically, this is this is the uh, GUI. So uh, let's let's go back to our first of all. Uh, uh, if you if you are not sure what to do, click on examples. There is a lot of uh, a nice example query. And uh, if we go to the cats query, so I promised you I I will show you how to deal with the uh, this uh, queue items. So um, what you do, you just hover over it. It, it tells you what it is. So uh, what if you want to write one yourself? So you press Ctrl Space, and let's say you want instead of Instead of a cat, you want a dog. You just select it, and it automatically substitutes you uh, the, the okay. So back back to the uh, to the presentation. So um, uh, next thing that I wanted to show is basically what what else we want to do with the we can do with the GUI. So let's uh, continue with our uh, uh, cats and uh, let's uh, see uh, what internet is really for and that's cat pictures. So uh, basically uh, what we can have is um, if we have uh, images, then we have, can also have uh, the images in, in the GUI. Uh, we can also have uh, other visualization modes. So we have, um, uh, for example, we have maps. So this is map of the uh, Berlin uh, U-Bahn stations. You see a nice kind of nice route. So we can uh, map uh, the items uh, on the map. Uh, next thing we can do, we can uh, build um, graphs that uh, present data. So this is, for example, the uh, tree of uh, Chinggis Han uh, ancestry. So once it actually builds it, yeah. So let me just enhance it. So we have this this graph. So this is Kublai. So where is the Chinggis himself? Yeah. Here he is. So you can you can see basically they hold the industry and descendants of Chinese Han. So you can build this nice uh, visualizations with it. So what you else you can do? You can also if you have uh, some data that uh, uh, are ranked, you can also build uh, the uh, bubble charts. So this is uh, for example the bubble chart of the uh, causes of death in in uh, in Wikipedia in Wikidata. Uh, and yes, we can also build timelines. I don't have time to show all of them, but click on display and you have uh, here have a list of what you can do. So experiment uh, with those uh, when, you, when you have time. And also one thing that I want to notice on this one, if you look really closely here, there is another service that I haven't talk, talked about because I don't have time, but I check into it. So there are more services available. Uh, so uh, next thing I wanted to show you is basically that you can also, uh, this is kind of the project in uh, in progress, so that, that's probably the last thing I'm uh, sh showing to you today, is uh, that you can actually build your own graphs. So this is a, a query that says how many musicians die at a certain age. So let's say we wanted to create a graph from it. So we say graph it. And we have this Polestar interface that uh, allows you to build your own graphs. So let's say you want 
lines instead. So then you click on export and you have this uh, this graph and then you can go just just go to Wikipedia page. And put a graph here. And let's see. And you have a graph. And this this graph is uh, completely data driven. So if you, if you actually look at the source, uh, you have a query inside. So basically, this this uh, graph is data driven, and if data changes, this graph uh, changes, and you don't have to do much except for like copy paste, uh, create the query, and create the graph uh, with drop downs and uh, copy paste it, and you can actually take it further uh, with uh, Yuri's uh, help. Uh, we have uh, uh, templates that you can do. So, for example, there is a template uh, that. Uh, uh, London population history. So you see the Q1. Uh, remember, we see the Q for London. So if you replace for with the ID for any other city, you would get this nice graph for any city you like. And uh, you also combine this with uh, maps. So this, for example, is a, a data-driven uh, a map of of uh, a country, and it includes the capitals of all the states and populations and images. So again, this is this is all uh, configurable by country. So we have the IDs here, and it's uh, generated from Wikidata and OSM services. So this combines basically two services into into this uh, vis visualization. So uh, that uh, concludes our uh, demo part, and uh, I'm basically done. Uh, and kind of I can say now on you are on your own, except that you are not. There is a lot of things that you can uh, get help from. Uh, there is a list of link in this presentation, so you can uh, use it uh, when the slides are published. You can use them to learn about Sparkle and our implementation of it. Uh, and you can use, uh, we have a lot of community resources. Uh, that we have a bunch of tools, that, so I want to uh, mention one specifically. It's a converter from, um, uh, all the Wikidata query syntax uh, to Sparkle. So use it if you're familiar with the old one. And the next two ones is for properties and uh, classes. And uh, this is the uh, list of community resources that you can go to to discuss queries, ask about queries, look at the examples, uh, and uh, discuss all the things related to, to this uh, thing. So with that, um, uh, I'm uh, concluding this uh, presentation and uh, uh, please uh, contact us on the mailing list or on the IRC if you have any questions or need any help uh, with, uh, with this. Fantastic. Let's give uh, Stas a random applause. <laughs> Vega Export uh, is really cool. I haven't seen that before. Um, Okay, and with that, uh, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. Uh, that's Ruben, I believe. Um, and uh, Ruben, you should be up next and connected. There we go. Everybody seeing uh, the future is federated on screen now? Yes, we are. Okay, very good. So as Dario said, um, this is a slightly shorter version of a talk I gave at um, Vivo which will be about um, how we can execute Sparkle queries, not against one data source, but against multiple data sources and this live on the web. Now, why is that? Well, knowledge is actually, it's inherently distributed, if, if you think about it. Um, knowledge is never gonna be in one central place. There's always gonna be multiple sources of truth and even Wikidata will never be the, the single place where everything is stored. And that's actually, that's a good thing because this is how human knowledge works. What's also the case is that um, human knowledge is inherently heterogeneous. So there's different kinds of knowledge in different types of formats and so on and so forth. But fortunately on the web, knowledge is also inherently linked, connected to each other in various ways. This is of course the essence of linked data. And if you want to query such knowledge, this inherently distributed but still linked, 
there are important questions to answer, such as um, where do we find the data that we need? How can we access the data that we need? Um, and how can we integrate the data together? And what I'll show today with a demo is that it is possible to integrate multiple data sources and doing this live on the web, but we will need to set our expectations right. Federation cannot solve all problems, just like centralization cannot solve all problems, cannot have all data in the world. So if you all agree that, well, we will not be able to do actual magic here, but still pretty cool stuff, then I think we have the right base to continue. So um, today I'll be talking about three things. First, I'll talk a bit about Sparkle and RDF. I know you just had the introduction, so I won't talk too much about that. But still, there's a couple of important things to say about Sparkle that haven't been said before. The next thing I'll be talking about is um, lightweight interfaces to um, RDF on the web. So um, the Wikidata endpoint is a very heavy endpoint, which means it can do all kinds of nice things that we've just seen in the previous talk. Actually, um, for some use cases, lightweight interfaces are preferred, and I'll explain why and how they work. And then at the last part, I'll show you a demonstration of how we can query multiple sources live on the web. So first, let's talk a tiny bit more about um, Sparkle and RDF. Um, so as you just have seen, um, RDF is the data language that we use for uh, the semantic web and linked data. And as was discussed, the basic unit of RDF data is a triple, and a triple consists of three parts. There's a subject, a predicate, and an object. It's really that simple. And Wikidata um, has also been made available as RDF data. Then there's Sparkle, but actually Sparkle is, is two things. So as we have seen in the previous language, uh, on the one hand, Sparkle is a query language, which you can use to um, ask questions on RDF data stores. But at the same time, Sparkle is also a protocol to execute such Sparkle queries over the web. And in this presentation, I'll be criticizing Sparkle a lot. Just know that I'm not criticizing Sparkle the language. I am criticizing Sparkle the protocol. I think the language is a wonderful idea. I'm just not sure whether the protocol is also a wonderful idea. So what exactly is the Sparkle protocol? Well, basically, um, in the interaction, you always have a client, and the client will use the Sparkle protocol to ask a Sparkle query to a Sparkle endpoint. So the, the thing in pink there is, is a query. It's a query in a Sparkle language. And um, a Sparkle endpoint is basically a server that says, you can ask me any Sparkle query. The Sparkle protocol is simply a set of agreements on how the client should send a Sparkle query over the web. So that's it. The Sparkle protocol is send your Sparkle queries to some server on the web. So this means that you can say things like, um, hey, Sparkle endpoint, I have a question for you. I want to know um, which artists are born in San Francisco. And the Sparkle endpoint will reply, well, no problem. Sure, here you go. Here you have a list of artists. Um, and the thing is, you can also ask your Sparkle endpoint, and hey, Sparkle endpoint, I have this really complicated question. And by the way, this is an actual existing query. And a Sparkle endpoint will say, sure, no problem. Here's the answer. And I think you're kind of seeing where I'm going here. Um, Sparkle endpoints are very nice. In fact, they're a bit too nice. They'll do everything you ask from them, and as such, you can imagine that it's very expensive to host such a Sparkle endpoint. So the question is, um, can I Sparkle your endpoints? Like, well, for Wikidata, this is true. You have a powerful Sparkle endpoints, and you have the funds to keep this up, which is great. But there's lots of smaller organizations, lots of people or institutions publishing data who don't have the money to, to have a Sparkle endpoint, because having a website is very cheap. But having a Sparkle endpoint is about it's about the most expensive API that exists on the web. And as a result, there are two problems with Sparkle endpoints. First of all, if you look on the web, we don't have a lot of Sparkle endpoints, just because they are so expensive to host. So again, congratulations, Wikidata, with your endpoint. I'm really happy you have it. But for most organizations, unfortunately, it's not feasible. And the second problem is that of all those endpoints that exist, the average endpoint is down for one and a half days each month. 
And this is quite a disaster because this means that if I'm going to build an application on top of that Sparkle endpoint, my application is at least going to be down for one and a half days each month. And if I'm building an application on top of multiple Sparkle endpoints, let's say just three endpoints, well, in the worst case, my application is going to be down for four and a half days each month. In other words, the application won't just be reliable. And why is this such a problem? Well, this means that the whole vision of a semantic web of having applications on the web with live data, it's just not working. So let's see what we can do to, to fix that. And this brings me to the second part of the talk um, in which I want to explain what we've built. We've built a more lightweight RDF interface, um, which is less expensive to host. But of course, this comes at a price, which I'll explain next. So when I'm designing interfaces, um, I'm not primarily thinking about um, machines or computers. I'm always asking the question first, what would the average human do? So a little background about myself. My, um, I'm a researcher and my re research focuses on building intelligent clients. So when I'm designing interfaces for those intelligent automated clients, I'm still thinking about people. If I would solve this as a person, how would I approach this? And this is my inspiration to design for machines. So for instance, how would the average human um, solve the question that we've seen before? This Sparkle query that says, give me things that are artists, give me the name of those things, and those things should have birthplace San Francisco. In other words, give me the names of artists born in San Francisco. Of course, if you give this to an average human, they will panic because they haven't seen Sparkle. That is, unless they have seen the tutorial we had previously. So let's imagine that an average human gets a question, which artists were born in San Francisco? How would they answer this question if they only have uh, Wikipedia? Well, if I were an average human, what I would do is I would just go to the page about San Francisco on Wikipedia, for instance. Then I would make a list of all the people that are born there in San Francisco. And then for each of the members on that list, I would check their Wikipedia pages to see if they're an artist. Sounds like a great plan, except that the second step isn't entirely realistic, because how can we be sure that the page of San Francisco has a list of all people that were born there? Maybe there's a person born in San Francisco that's not on that page. So this method has some limits to it. Um, and this means that if we want the person to be able to do this, we need to empower them. We need to give the average human just a little something extra to make sure that they can answer a simple question like this one. But I'm not going to give them a sparkle endpoint because they are really, really, really expensive to, uh, to keep up. So I'll give them something else. And then the question comes, what is the simplest complexity? So given that Sparkle is way too expensive and given that simple hyperlinks like on um, Wikipedia are insufficient, what is the simplest thing that I can do to still enable a human to answer this question? Well, to find a solution to this, I went back to the essence of RDF. And the essence of RDF, as you know by now, is triples. Everything in RDF is a triple, a subject, a predicate, and an object. Now, the essence of linked data is that you can browse things by subject. You can go to a page of a certain person on Wikidata or Wikipedia, and you will get all information about them. So for instance, if I know everything about San Francisco, I just go to the San Francisco page on Wikidata or Wikipedia. Now, what we propose is an interface called TPF. And TPF does this little extra thing where you can not only choose your subject, you can choose any of the three components. So you can say, no, no, I want to know things that have San Francisco in the object position, not just the subject position. In other words, I want to see things that link to San Francisco, not just the things that San Francisco is linking to. So this is the interface we propose. You can ask questions that consist of a triple pattern. Remember in a previous presentation, the basis of Sparkle queries is a triple pattern, well, or interface does just triple patterns. And this is also what TPF means. TPF stands for triple pattern fragments. So our lightweight interface will um, offer access to a data set based in parts and fragments that you can select by a triple pattern. 
This means that clients can only ask for triple patterns to the server. So they cannot say here is my complex Sparkle query. That's not possible. They can only ask for a single triple pattern at a time. So let's see how an average human would answer the question, which artists were born in San Francisco if they were given a TPF interface of DBpedia. Maybe a small intermezzo here. What is DBpedia? Well, DBpedia is similar to Wikidata, but the difference is that um, Wikidata is really manually created, uh, whereas DBpedia is automatically derived from, from uh, Wikipedia data. So um, DBpedia is, in a sense, the predecessor to Wikipedia, uh, to Wikidata, sorry. Why did I choose DBpedia instead of Wikidata? Well, because DBpedia is a little easier to explain. So everything that I'm saying right now would also work with Wikidata. It's just that the data model of DBpedia is slightly simpler, which makes it easier for me to explain it to you. But everything I say applies to Wikidata as well. So, human, we give him or her this question, and um, they can only use a TPF interface of DBpedia, which is kind of like the Wikipedia and RDF. What would an average human do? Well, um, if I were to do it, I would say, well, first, give me all things with a predicate of birthplace and an object of San Francisco. In other words, get me the list of things born in San Francisco. This time, it works because we have this extra mechanism. Remember, we couldn't do this on regular um, Wikipedia because we only could ask, um, give me things that San Francisco is linking to. But here, thanks to the extra complexity in the interface, we can also ask the opposite, give me things that have as birthplace San Francisco. So once I have this list, I go to the next step. And now of those list of people, um, let's check for each of them whether they are an artist. So let's say that I had a list of 500 people born in San Francisco. For each of the 500 I check, is this guy born in San Francisco? And then I'm left with a shorter list. Let's say I have, I don't know, 100 artists, for instance. And then for each of those people, I can say, well, I have their address, now give me their full name. And this is how an average human would do it if they were given a TPF interface to DBpedia. And guess what? An average machine would do the exact same steps. Now you can ask, how will the machine know what questions to ask to the server? Well, the thing is, the answer is already in a Sparkle query. Those three patterns here are just the same patterns of a Sparkle query. So let me, have, uh, let me resume here. If you had a Sparkle endpoint on the server side, you would just take the entire Sparkle query and send it to the server. This is very easy for the client, but it's very expensive for a server if lots of clients do this. What we propose is instead that the client splits this complex Sparkle query into pieces and then sends them to the server. Now, this might sound a little abstract, so let me show this to you in a very concrete way. I'm going to show a live demo on, on this. So what you're seeing um, right now is a browser window, and I'm now going to um, client.link data fragments. No, first, sorry. First, I'm going to show you the data interface. So this is a TPF interface on top of um, DBpedia, and I can indeed say things like, give me all triples that have San Francisco as an object, and here I have the whole list. Then I can also say, give me all triples that have Adrian Evans, for instance, as a subject, and they are right here. So I can ask any triple pattern query, nothing more complex, just those. So if you now go to clients.linkdatafragments.org, we get an in-browser client written in JavaScript that is able to um, answer these um, queries from the browser. So I have the same query here. Give me artists born in San Francisco. I want their names. And I also added an extra filter saying, I only want the English names. Don't give me the Japanese or Chinese names for that. So when I click execute query, what happens is that my clients right here in the browser will decompose the complex Sparkle query into triple patterns, send those to the server, as you can see right here, and display me the results in a streaming way. So let me do that again. When I click Execute Query, the client is splitting the Sparkle query into small fragments, and the results come streaming in here. Now, the first thing you might notice is, well, this is actually a little slower than if you would do it with a Sparkle endpoint. This takes a couple of seconds, whereas with a Sparkle endpoint, you would get it immediately. 
Yes, this is true, but with Sparkle endpoints, you would have a downtime of one and a half days each month, if you're unlucky. This system is much cheaper for the server, so much less likely to go down. So yes, this takes a couple of seconds, but it's the same amount of seconds today, tomorrow, tonight, next week. This interface simply does not go down, which was for me much more important than having a service that is fast. Of course, it all depends on your constraints, but for us, this was one of the main points, and I'll explain why in just a sec. But the final part that I want to talk about is about querying multiple Sparkle um, interfaces at the same time. Because what you've seen previously is queries um, against Wikidata, which is one endpoint. But if we try to do this with multiple endpoints, well, the problems accumulate. One endpoint is done for one and a half days, so two endpoints might be done for three days. And well, if you have three endpoints, it's just not worth getting started. The good thing is that federated queries are totally native to TPF clients. It's really simple. Instead of asking your questions to one server, just ask the same questions to different servers. It is that easy. So let me show you how this works. Let's try a Sparkle query over um, multiple endpoints at the same time. So what I'm, what I'm having here is a more complex Sparkle query. And basically, um, I'm using three data sources here. I'm having DBpedia, which we had earlier. I'm using VOF, which is a database about authors and works. And I'm using the Harvard dataset, which is a dataset of the Harvard library. And the question I'm having is, well, I'm standing here in front of the Harvard library, and I want to read books that are written by people who are born in San Francisco. And if you look at the Sparkle query, you don't see anything special. It's just the same things, people born in San Francisco. I want to have their name. I want to have the title of the book. But when I click Execute Query, the client will use those three data sources to answer the question. And that's, in fact, what we're seeing right here. You see multiple sources and being consulted, and the results really come streaming in at a fast rate. Why am I using multiple sources here? Well, the thing is that each of those sources individually does not have the answers. Wikipedia does not know about what books Harvard has. And VF knows about authors and their works, but VF doesn't know where those authors are born. So thanks to the combination of those three, I can see the answer to a complex query. And you might notice that those results, again, they come in streaming, they come in live in your browser. If you try this with a Sparkle endpoint, well, I'll be honest with you, I've never seen Sparkle Endpoint Federation work on the web because it's just so expensive, it's just so difficult. With this lightweight interface, it's not a problem at all which is um, really cool. And something else that's very cool is that all of this software is written in JavaScript, so you can just build live browser applications with it. For instance, here's an example of another um, Sparkle query. And um, what I'm doing here is that I'm using data from, from Vivo to say, well, give me organizations from the Vivo data source, and I want to have their logo, I want to have the Wikidata identifier. So here you see the Wikidata identifier of Brand University. They have a logo and they have some other information as well. So what I can do now is um, I can build an application on top of that. So I can, I'm here looking at the JavaScript application where I say, well, I want to start a Sparkle query over those three data sources and then retrieve the data and do something nice with them. In this case, when I click execute, Data is streaming in live, and I'm rendering the logos, the Wikidata link, and so on and so forth. So when I click here, for instance, on the Wikidata link, I'm actually being sent to the Butler University page on Wikidata. And all of this is coming from three different data sources at once. But this is how easy it is to work with live link data from multiple sources on the web right in your browser. And the best thing of all is that it's really affordable. So you don't have to have an expensive endpoint. You can just have a lightweight interface as a, as a small library or whatever, and people can browse your data and build applications on the web, and everything keeps on working 99.9% .9 of time, which is great. And the other great thing is, um, what I've explained before is that, yes, TPF gives more cheap servers, but the drawback is that performance is slower. However, as I told before, I'm a researcher and we measure things like performance and bandwidth and so on. What we've seen is that in federated scenarios, TPF can in fact be 
as good as Sparkle and Poise for Federation, and sometimes even be faster. So Federation is definitely a totally different scenario, and if you want to make this thing work, I think lightweight interfaces are the way. So today we've talked about um, Spark and RDF, about why I think lightweight interfaces are very important, and I've shown you a demo of Federation. And this demo is why I really believe that Federation with a TPF interface is a game changer. Because yes, it's possible to have Sparkle endpoints, but they alone will never create it on the web. So this is why I think we need a combination of Sparkle endpoints and cheaper interfaces to do Federation. Now, um, I shouldn't overpromise. Federation is not always possible. Some queries will always be hard on the open web. For instance, if I'm saying things like count the number of cat pictures on the web, well, this query will literally take forever. I mean, if you centralize data, it's easy. If you have one endpoint with all data, then you know you'll get the answer. But since the web is open, some queries will always be hard. But that's a challenge that we take. And actually, as I have shown, many more queries than you think are pretty fast. So the queries that I've shown were quite complex and still thousands of results arrived within several seconds. So, and most of all is, even though it takes a couple of seconds, results come in streaming. So if you're building an application, you don't have to wait until all results have arrived. As with a Sparkle endpoint, you can start showing things to the user right away. And the best thing of the whole story is that all of the software that you've seen, all of the specifications, all of the research is open source. It's all available at linkdatafragments.org. So if you want to start with your own um, lightweight RDF server, if you want to start with federated queries yourself, then there's no excuse, you can just start doing it. This is the end of my talk. What I'll just do is um, in the blue jeans chat window, I will paste the links of the queries that I have shown to you so that you can start experimenting um, with them yourself. So here is the artist query that I've shown. Here is the query about finding books in Harvard Library uh, by San Francisco authors. Here's a query with um, organizations and Vivo. And the last link is the quick browser application that shows how you can work with live linked data in applications in your browser. That's it from my side. Thanks very much for having me. And if there's any questions, please let me know. And um, I won't be here until the end because it's already um, 10 p.m. here. So if you have any immediate questions, ask them now. If anything else, you can always send me an email, whatever. I'm very reachable. Thanks. Thanks, Raoul Ruben. That was awesome. And we do have, in fact, uh, five minutes. We're pretty much on track at the moment. So if you have questions, uh, I think we had a couple on IRC. Uh, so I'd be happy to relay them. Um, Eric, I think you had one. Is that solved already? What I was curious about is, uh, obviously, this is executing many more queries. Uh, some of your examples were executing 200 or 1,000 queries per, uh, per answer. And I was wondering how that, uh, how that plays out with scaling things, because I, that's one of the things I worry about when I'm developing a system, is that you know, if it issues a 1,000 queries, that, that this is going to be a lot of server resources. Yes, that's a very great question, and I have an even greater answer to that, if I may, may say so. Um, I'm going to quickly reshare my um, screen again so, so you can see some data on that. Um, so I'm very happy that you asked, because like I said, I am a researcher, and it's our job to measure exactly those things. So what I have on screen right now is a research paper, which I'll share with you but I'll get to some of the graphs on there. So uh, we've measured what happens if you have lots and lots of clients. And the graph that you see right here shows um, on the top half, you see um, Sparkle endpoint performance. On the bottom half, you see our client server um, setup. And this is what happens if the number of clients increases. And notice that the axis is logarithmic. So Sparkle endpoint performance drastically goes down if more and more clients arrive. Whereas our solution starts out slow, but at least remains <coughs> equally slow. We are much better at, at dealing um, with high loads. Share the publication through the chat so uh, you can have a detailed look at the results that we have in there. Awesome. I think also Andy had a question at some point about uh, the, um, uh, the VF example and the Harvard data set. Andy, are you, are you in the chat? Can you unmute yourself? I don't know if that was Andy, uh, but uh, um, 
Well, maybe maybe we can follow up uh, later uh, if you have additional questions. Andy, you can forward them to Ruben. Um, okay, I think we have uh, time now for maybe a five minute break before we continue. Um, so stick around for the second part of the workshop. Thanks, everybody. Okay, I think we're gonna start again. Um, Tim and Ben, are you guys there? Yeah, we're here. <laughs> All right, the stage is yours. Okay, so thanks for uh, the opportunity to be here with you guys today. Some really nice technical um, discussions before this. This talk will be a bit different. It'll be more less about the kind of technology and how things work and more about an application of it um, or several applications of it. Um, I'm, in fact, I think in my part of this, I'm only going to do one Sparkle query, but it's a Sparkle query that may save, save your life someday. So hopefully that's interesting to you. Um, Tim will follow me, and he will get into a little more of the nitty gritty of um, the technical aspects of this work. And so, as you can see there, I'm coming in, we're both coming from Scripps Research. I've been a part of uh, this GeneWiki project for last several years now, although I wasn't, part, wasn't there when it got started. And so, um, let me explain what that is. See that slide, please. Okay, and so before, Proceeding further, just to make it clear, this, the GeneWiki project is a, a large group of people. I wanted to highlight the people that are most actively involved right now, in particular Andrew Sue, who is uh, our boss here at Scripps and who is the one that really started off this project um, quite a while ago. Sorry, my screen is just freaking out here right on time. Um, Sorry, hold on, technical difficulties over here. Okay, um, and then Andre Wagmeister, who's actually our Sparkle guru on the team and is a consultant for our project. And then two postdocs that work here at Scripps, Sebastian and Tim, who we'll be hearing from uh, shortly. So this is all thanks to their work. And so the point, so coming back to the GenoQ project and its um, purpose, and all really all of our purpose here doing bioinformatics work at Scripps Research oriented around organization of knowledge. I said curation of knowledge in the title. So here, here is an example of knowledge um, about a specific human gene and as it's presented to most scientists that we work with. So this is a query interface at PubMed, which is the central repository of journal article abstracts for the life sciences. And so if you query for this particular gene, you'll get many thousands of results there. Um, so we have quite a bit of knowledge to organize, and that's our job. Um, and of course, this is important. This is the foundation for all science, um, all the drugs and so forth that, like I said, may eventually save your life. Um, and even to this date, despite all of our efforts and many other people's efforts, most of it remains uh, represented in the text of these journal articles. And so to give you a, an idea of the scale uh, of the work that we're doing here, um, within the life sciences, according to PubMed, that resource there, we publish about two articles every minute. And that's only the articles that are written in English that make it into that repository. And so that means that we're at uh, more than a million per year and growing rapidly. And so it's quite a challenge. And from that challenge, um, the GeneWiki project was born. And so the purpose of the GeneWiki Gene is to take all of the information about human genes, at, at least that's how it started, coming into repositories like PubMed, and turn them into a, basically a review article for every human gene. So that when you wanted to know about this particular one, fibronectin, instead of reading 30,000 journal articles, you go to one place and get a synthesis of that knowledge that would then link you back out to the important places where that information is located. So this is really the goal of the project at a high level. And so this is something that started, uh, like I said, a while ago. And these are examples of what we refer to as gene wiki pages, although they are just like any other page on Wikipedia. And so what we have done, what the group has done, um, is add quite a bit of automation to the creation and maintenance of these articles 
based on the structured data that we have access to from other databases. And so GeneWiki articles are created as stub articles automatically by our bot. The stub will contain a little one sentence summary of it. And importantly, all of this information here on the left about the structure of the protein that's re represented, um, various ways that genes are represented in other databases, links to those databases, where the genes expressed in the body, uh, references where all this information will come from and so forth. And the idea is that by creating these templates, these, these basic structures, and keeping all the information in them as up-to-date as we can, we provide a landing place where people can come and get a little bit of information, and then they can go ahead and, when they're able, fill in the text that will form the article. And that was the basic idea. And so to give you an idea of where we came from, where we're going, and where we are, this project started out in 2007. Um, around 2008, they got approval and executed the first very large bot run um, using a bot called the Protein Box Bot and created uh, articles for about 9,000 human genes. Also, when those gene articles already existed, they basically updated them, so they are all using that um, InfoBox template. Uh, a year later, we we're approaching 10,000 genes and we made a big update to the bot. 2011, this is about when I came into the mix here, uh, we were up over 10,000, and as some of the work in my postdoc, we basically showed that the project was essentially working, um, that in addition to articles growing, the text in the articles was growing, so people were actually doing what we had hoped to do. Um, and so we, bit by bit, we were accumulating uh, that trove of review articles. And there's also quite a bit of analysis done on the quality of the text. Very low vandalism, even compared to the rest of Wikipedia, which is also fairly low vandalism. Um, now, where this starts getting interesting here, and I think interesting to me, about two years ago now, we got an NIH grant um, that would support us in this work going forward. And at the same time, Wikidata started to become a useful thing. And so we started moving our data that they, we were managing into Wikidata. And, um, a big thing that happened in this project earlier this year, we were able to convert all of our efforts within Wikipedia for human genes such that they draw all of the information that produces those boxes that you see there, the pictures, everything from Wikidata. And the other thing that's quite exciting this year that Tim will be talking about after me is that apart from Wikipedia, Wikidata is now being able to drive other applications, and we'll get into that later. Um, a lot of this is tracked and there are references on the portal GeneWiki page on Wikipedia. So let me explain for Wiki folks here what this means to us, and I'm sure you can appreciate this. So that template that I described there looks like that middle panel there in Wiki text. Um, it's many embedded templates within them to get it formatted properly and so forth. The way it was done uh, initially meant that we had one version of these for every one of those you know, 10,000 plus articles we maintained. So to keep them up to date involved quite a bit of error prone uh, parsing and processing. And it was basically just a, a really terrible way to handle data, um, but we did it. All of those 10,000 articles now are represented by this one Infobox gene template. Um, so that has been now, instead of maintaining the template, the data inside of these templates, we maintain the data in Wikidata, and we worry about formatting it and showing it in the Lua code that runs that template. So that, that was a, a huge just technical step forward for us. Um, and I think, I, I think it's fair to say that we're one of the more advanced uses of Wikidata on Wikipedia right now. So, I think, you know, we're big Wikipedia fans. We've been working on this for a long time. And, but when we look at Wikidata, I think the impact, the potential impact is a lot, goes far beyond what is going to happen within Wikipedia. And that impact will be mediated through that Sparkle endpoint. That's the language that other apps are going to speak when they grab data from it. So, right now, just to give you an idea of what, what we've done and what we're sort of working towards maintaining in here. Um, right now, within Wikidata, we have items in there for every human and every mouse 
And in fact, every macaque and every rat um, gene that's known that we know about and associated proteins and gene products for all of those organisms. Uh, we also have all of the gene ontology terms. So the gene ontology is a reference vocabulary for describing the function of genes in terms of their localization, uh, molecular function, and the biological processes that they operate in. So all of that, which is about 40,000 terms, those are all entities now that can be used within Wikidata. We've done the same thing for the human disease ontology, which is just what it sounds like. It's about 9,000 terms. And we've also imported all FDA-approved drugs, um, and there's been a significant investment in time recently in expanding to other chemicals. And um, as Tim will talk about later, we also have uh, more than 100 reference microbial genomes. So this is important for uh, the microbiome research that you, many of you have probably heard about a little bit. So what we're doing here is what we hope to do is be planting the seeds for a network of knowledge to grow within Wikidata that everybody can share in. And so although I would say that ne that network remains pretty thin, we have got to the point this year where we can start doing some interesting queries. So there is a link there at the top if you want to explore a kind of long, relatively unstructured list of things we've been playing with. Um, but just to give you some basic examples, you can say ask basic queries like, where in the cell is the relin protein expressed? So is it in the nucleus or is it the membrane and so forth? What diseases does a particular drug, drug treat? And the one query I, I want to show you is very simple. It's a query for something we don't know yet, and the, what, disease, what diseases might be treated by metformin. So this is an example of a scientific use case of the data in a Sparkle Graph, and that is actually in uh, Wikidata. So the question is, okay, I have a drug, in this case it's metformin, what diseases might it treat? And so we already know that this is a, um, a diabetes drug. So could we use it for other things? This is a big business right now um, in the world of drug repurposing. And so it turns out that we have a pattern which you can find in the literature that shows one example of how you can find new candidates for repurposing. And that pattern runs like this. So if that, that drug has a physical interaction with a protein, that protein's encoded by a gene that has a genetic association with the disease, it turns out that that drug turns, may be related to that disease and may have an impact on it. And so we can ask that question with this Sparkle query. Um, so I'm looking for uh, genes and, and diseases here to fill in the pieces of this graph. And I'm saying, okay, Q19484 is metformin in Wikidata. Um, 129 is physical interaction. And I'm saying, okay, so metformin interacts with this, this protein. This protein then is encoded by this gene, and this gene has a genetic association with this disease. Execute that query, which you can do. You can click on the, the tiny URL there in the slides I shared in the chat if you want. And you'll get. Um, several diseases back along with the gene that linked um, metformin to them. Uh, this was a nice example as it turns out that people are, are actually researching the use of metformin for prostate cancer um, you know, in, in the recent literature. And so uh, it validates that you know, there are some interesting things to be discovered there. Now this is a pretty simple query over what I would, again, I would, I would reiterate is a fairly light representation of the knowledge in the world but it's a nice starting point um, for making uh, what I hope is a good example of how we can use this for science. And so with that, I want to transition over to Tim, and he's right here in the same slide, so he can just jump on the computer and continue on. One second. OK, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk today. This is really great to get an overview of other people's work in Sparkle and Wikidata. Um, so I am a molecular biologist by training, and I'm a postdoc here in Andrew Sue's group working with Ben on um, loading bacterial genomes into Wikidata alongside the human, mouse, and other <clears throat> uh, mammal species that we've loaded to Wikidata. So 
Um, really hot topic is microbiome, and um, a linked data model is a great way to explore the microbiome. So this is this is where my focus is. Um, he already really did all, all of our acknowledgments, so I'll use his slide for that, but acknowledge Ben, who just spoke, um, and jump right into it. <clears throat> so real quick on the data I've loaded into Wikidata and, and the structure of it, uh, which makes the Sparkle queries make a little more sense if you can see the overall structure of the data. Uh, we have already in Wikidata, before I started, there was bacterial lineages um, existing in Wikidata where a species parent taxon is the genus, um, its parent taxon is the order, et cetera, going all the way up to the domain, which is bacteria. Uh, so what I, uh, came here to do is to add genomes, their genes and proteins of bacteria to Wikidata to create that stub, um, like Ben mentions for the Gene Wiki project, that people can add to semantic relationships and things like that. Um, interesting things, the drugs that treat them, um, the diseases they cause. And so we really want to create this structured data model. Um, and so I created a strain, um, an item for the, the genome that was sequenced, which is essentially a strain of that species. Um, and then linked all the proteins and the genes to that through the found in taxon property. So the hierarchy is, um, is, is, is shown here where you have the item for chlamydia trachomatis, uh, the strain, which is the, um, which also represents the genome that was sequenced, um, through the parent taxon, oops, through the parent taxon property, you, you ascend through the hierarchy. And if you kept going, you'd get to bacteria. Um, and if you go in the other direction, um, the found in taxon property links genes to that genome, um, as well as the proteins, and those are linked to each other through the encodes and encoded by property. So it's really this stable structure uh, that can be built off of. And <clears throat> our whole purpose is to build a data model that will aid in biological research and, and to also provide a platform for basic researchers to consume the data, um, in, a, in a way that has context for their work that makes sense to them rather than going into Wikidata's interface and clicking through things. Um, they need something that's a little more intuitive for, for their work. And we also want to have them provide information, um, edits and statements and things like that. We'd like to provide a way for them to, um, to push those to Wikidata as well. So we're, we're making a, a, a web application. Um, it's called the Centralized Model Organism Database. And so when you load the application, uh, you see that there's a form there and it says start typing the name of an organism to continue. Right now, as I'm the bacteria guy and I'm building this, it only contains bacteria. We'll, we'll include more later. Um, it requires tweaking of the model a little bit. But what you do is you start typing and um, when the page was loaded, this query is executed through a, an Ajax get request. Uh, and what happens in this query is that it's looking for um, select any organism essentially that has the parent taxon of uh, bacteria. And so this asterisk means that you're recursively going back through um, this model all the way to bacteria through the parent taxon property. Um, so essentially what it's saying is get me any bacteria items in Wikidata, and then we're gonna narrow it down um, by saying uh, select only the ones that have an NCBI taxonomy ID. And then we're going to narrow it down to those that have their genome sequenced by saying give me a, a genome refseq ID from NCBI. So these items all have given, been given these core identifiers. And then, of course, the service to get the labels. And so we get a list, essentially, of all the bacteria in Wikidata um, that have had their genome sequenced. And when you start typing, you get a drop-down list of options. Um, you can see the identifiers involved. You click on one. And what happens is the page is redirected and it executes another Sparkle query. Now this Sparkle query uses the tax ID we just got from selecting that organism to then get all the genes and proteins, um, at least the identifiers for all the genes and proteins um, uh, that are in that genome. And so give me the, the organism uh, based on the tax ID and then select gene items that are found in that organism. P703 is found in taxon. Uh, and then this is a list of identifiers and annotations. Give me the entree gene ID, um, select for the genomic start and stop position. Um, the locus tag is another identifier. Uh, and 
and so you're getting this basic data about the genes and then it's also um, has an optional block here that says if there's a protein codes I'd like the information for that as well um, so you're getting you're getting this, this large amount of information for this bacteria when you select it and then it redirects to this page where it, where it's actually using that data so real quick um, that organism data on the first query is displayed here. Uh, this is a place where we can add more information about that organism um, or a user could. Uh, down here is where the gene information is displayed. You have um, identifiers, the Wikidata ID, it all links to the different databases they come from. Um, information about the gene annotation. We have built in an open source genome browser called JBrowse, which visualizes where the genes lie on the genome. And this is novel that it runs off of Wikidata's Sparkle endpoint to get the annotations as well. And then the information about the protein that gene encodes will come up in a box down here. Now, this we're not really interested in this protein. Um, this is just auto-loaded on page load. So we have another um, search box up here where you can search for any of those genes that we um, gathered with the last Sparkle query. And it gives you another drop-down box just like the one you saw before, but this time for gene information. And so what happens when you select a gene, to populate this protein box down here, several, uh, a few queries are made for that simple gene. It takes the QID, and, or excuse me, it takes the Uniprot ID. And it says, find an item, a protein item in Wikidata that has this Uniprot ID. And then what we're doing here, because references are so important to what we do, um, we need to very clearly reference where this information came from for the scientific community to care about it. So what we're doing is we're using um, the property, the P prefix, to get information about the statement itself. So on that protein, select a statement um, that says that it has this interpro domain. Um, so that statement is going to have qualifiers and references attached to it. So this is how we, we get that kind of information. Um, so on that statement, I'd like the value of it. PS is the, the simple value of it, which is the Wikidata interpro domain item. So it's another item that we've created in Wikidata that has biological relevance that, that um, this, this protein has as a property. Um, and we link to that. And, and so now I've gotten the, the statement, and I'd like to get all the references so we can display the references on our application as well. And so we use prov was derived from and then you can display the different or you can use the different properties you'd like to return for the statements um, so this gets you the reference that um, stated in what database was it stated in what was the publication date um, the software version and a reference url for example for this interpro one and then give me the interpro id as well and this is a pretty um, complicated query but essentially what it returns is is this information and then it's just it's rendered in the protein uh, box on the web page so here is the interpro um, items label the interpro id and then if you click on one of the reference buttons you get the reference that's in wikidata um, for this item where we got it we got this information from this reputable database interpro was taken on this publication date the software version and the reference url as i mentioned before and I'll show what that looks like in Wikidata for another statement in a minute. And now what we really want to do is provide basic researchers a way to add information to Wikidata and our data model without breaking the model. Um, we put a lot of time and research into developing a very stable model, and it would be really hard to train people to do that properly with just the Wikidata um, interface. So what we've done is we've developed uh, some web forms on here that will allow people to, with a few clicks, make very defined statements. So if they find a piece of information in a PubMed article, like a molecular function that this gene or this protein um, has as an attribute, they can add that information themselves if it's not already there and cite the article they took it from. So if they click on the Add Molecular Function button, um, or essentially, excuse me, before that, they have to log into Wikidata and eventually this will use OAuth. Right now, I've just created a, a form um, to, to use my credentials, but um, eventually when it's, when it's live, people will be able to use OAuth um, to get Wikidata, to authorize the application to make edits. So you log in, you're logged into Wikidata, and you have this form. Um, Sparkle queries will find for you the gene ontology term, which is the represent, um, 
the, the representative item of the function that you're trying to add to this protein. Um, so you start typing the name of it, you'll get that function, you click on it, it finds the QID for that and places it there. Um, and then we'd like to add a qualifier. What, what is the evidence code? Um, was it inferred by experiment or by sequence alignment or something like that? So you can start typing the name of that and you'll get the evidence code that they're interested in. And then you put the PMID in and it finds the proper paper from NCBI and you click on that and you confirm that that's the PMID, um, the paper identifier you'd like to have as part of the statement you're going to add. And, and then they just hit edit wiki data. And what happens is it takes a few seconds. It tells you that you've successfully edited wiki data. But it does take a few minutes for the Sparkle endpoint to be updated so it will be um, viewed in the application when you refresh. So essentially, um, you can go right into Wikidata though, and this is what that kind of a statement would look like that someone just added. Uh, this property has uh, the statement, uh, molecular function is a predicate. Um, it's a protein kinase um, binding protein. Uh, the determination method is this qualifier that we added, um, which is EXP, which means it was inferred from an experiment, and then a very rich reference um, to say that it's stated in um, a scientific paper, uh, the work is in English, here's the ID for that, for that reference, which is the PubMed ID, and we've added this imported from the centralized model organism database um, reference to know that the, the, the actual annotation was made from the portal we've created and what day it happened as well. Um, so this really is a, is a way for someone that doesn't have experience with Sparkle, um, and essentially I'm saying basic biological researchers aren't likely to learn Sparkle to navigate the graph themselves. They aren't likely um, to be able to go into Wikidata, understand the data model, and add data to it without um, or with it and properly reference. Um, so we really need to provide those tools for people to, to do that and define the edits we really need help with so we can crowdsource annotating a lot of the information out there that's that's buried in text um, and so we can make it structured data. And with that, uh, I thank you for your time and uh, I don't know, do we have do we do questions right now? Or? Fantastic, thank you folks. So that officially ends uh, the uh, presentation section. And uh, I think a few uh, of our speakers are going to stick around. Uh, Lucas also here is the ultimate uh, chief sparkler uh, who can help us like, solve our questions. And, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so first I want to ask around uh, if there are uh, specific questions to this talk, um, or more broadly, anything we've seen before. And other than that, we can just uh, um, over examples, and there's no agenda for the remaining part uh, of the meeting, and it's not going to be recorded, or rather it's going to be trimmed before uh, the, the video is published.